Hi, I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today, will future wars be fought over water? We examine the world's scarcest critical resource. Our digital producer, Malika Bilal, is here looking out for your live feedback. Malika, it's hard to discuss an issue like this without talking about politics and economics and history. How's the uh, community weighing in? Well, all of those topics are represented in our tweets today, but what's inter interesting is people are also tweeting in from all around the world. So we have tweets from Tanzania, from Syria, from Canada, and this one from uh, one of our community's recent trip to the Middle East. Deanna says, during my trip to Gaza in 2010 is when I first had exposure to the fact that water is very limited for some people. Now, for those of you at home, it's a live conversation conversation, so we want you to join it by tweeting us with the hashtag AJStream. And joining us here on the set is journalist Stephen Solomon. He is the author of the book Water, the Epic Struggle for Wealth, Power, and Civilization. His book takes an historical look at the importance of water in a society and its current global scarcity. Stephen, welcome to the stream. Well, thank you very much. Remember, you can stay in touch with us on Facebook. Just like the stream, post your comments, and interact with our community about upcoming topics. It's just one more way for you to connect with us. Here are some of the hashtags that you've been following. More than 780 million people lack access to clean water around the world. And as global consumption grows at an alarming rate, a water crisis seems inevitable. The, in Yemen, the situation is already pretty dire. The water levels in many of the country's basins are naturally extremely low. The majority of the water supply is used to farm cot. That's a highly addictive leaf that's chewed by a lot of people. And because the crops are in such demand, the basins have very little time to refill. Years of political turbulence and social unrest have only pushed the issue lower on the government's agenda. Now, in Israel and the Palestinian territories, water has long been a contentious point, and with little cooperation on the issue, there's no long-term solution in sight. So whether it's due to issues of natural or politically created scarcity, will future wars be fought over water? To help take a deeper look into this developing water crisis in Yemen, we're joined by Anwar Sahuli. He is the team leader for the Yemen Water Sector Program with the German Society for International Cooperation and is a former member of the Yemeni Ministry of Water and the Environment. On Skype, we have Gidon Bromberg. He is the Israeli director of EcoPeace, Friends of the Earth Middle East. That's a regional organization that brings together Jordanian, Palestinian, and Israeli environmentalists to promote sustainable development and advance peace efforts in the region. And in Washington, Sandra Ruxtel. She is a senior conflict and development specialist who's worked on water issues in the West Bank, Gaza, and Yemen. All of you, welcome to the stream. Stephen, I, I want to start with you. In some parts of the Middle East, you know, a, a full-blown water crisis doesn't seem that far off. What's in store for places like Israel and Palestine and Yemen in the next decade or so? I would say that the Middle East is the first region to really run out of water in modern history. Uh, that is enough water to actually grow the food needed to sustain its population. The growth of the populations is putting extreme pressure on uh, water uh, throughout the entire region, so that the region already imports 50 percent of its food and likely will have to import 70 percent in the future. Yemen is really the front line of countries that are running out of water for many of the similar uh, reasons that I just explained. And why is Yemen running out? Because there are a lot of wells in Yemen. Well, they're relying on, they've always relied on groundwater. Populations are very, uh, are much larger than they were. Uh, people are hitting bottom in some of those uh, wells. They are also not using water efficiently, um, as commonly uh, is the case mm -hmm. uh, in, across the world. And people are also, therefore, piling into cities, uh, into the major capitals, Sana'a, which is a very high altitude city and uh, has to be uh, digging its wells deeper and deeper to try to be able to reach enough water to just satisfy the needs of its urban population. So uh, there are a, a, a confluence of factors uh, driving it, but they don't have a major river there. It's, it's always a, a rainfall-driven um, uh, water source. Uh, Anwar, describe for us how people in Yemen are feeling this shortage and, and to what extent that some people actually have to go to to get their water.
Well, the situation in Yemen is uh, very, very critical uh, in the sense that the uh, obstruction uh, of water, uh, sustainable water resources um, exceeds the recharge uh, by more than 35 percent of the national level. And in some critical basins like Sana'a, the obstruction is much more than the uh, recharge by 300 percent. Um, the situation is extremely uh, difficult uh, in Yemen and um, the popul in some uh, towns like Taiz, people are getting water uh, once in every one day in every 45 days. Wow. Uh, most most of the water is used for uh, irrigation uh, and uh, with a very low irrigation efficiency and 93% uh, of the uh, water uh, goes for irrigation uh, of um, water thirsty uh, products uh, like fruits watermelons etc but not for mm -hmm. uh, food security mm -hmm. like cereals okay Yemen i'm going to stop you there sir and i want our viewers to know that we've got about a three or four second delay between me and anwar so i'm not intentionally speaking over the top of him it just takes a little while to get there he's coming to us from berlin sandra i want to go to you you're going to yemen tomorrow um, in yemen particularly what do you think dictates who experiences water scarcity it seems to me, based on um, the analytical work that I've just started to do on this topic, it seems to me it really is an issue of um, economic well-being of the water users and what that means in terms of access to infrastructure and to equipment that's needed to get to the water, the subterranean uh, uh, water resources primarily. So it really does seem to be a matter of, as I said, economic well-being. Are, are you poor? Are you wealthy? Um, uh, where is your standing within a tribe or a community? That's what dictates, very simply, access to water. Well, Stephen, our community is weighing in here because they want to know how we got to this point um, as it is. There's a tweet here from Ahmed. He says, people in many countries take water for granted without understanding that their very existence depends on it. No water, no life. But then on the other hand, you have this very, very tweet, uh, Facebook comment rather, from Hai who says, people will fight over energy resources, but not water because it's recyclable. So w what do you do about this pervasive attitude that, you know, water is recyclable. It, it, it evaporates, it goes up into the atmosphere, it comes back down as rainwater. Is well, there, there's a famous, the famous adage. I think the uh, you, uh, ben Benjamin Franklin uh, once said, "You learn the worth of water when the well runs dry." Yeah. Uh, what's happening is the global well is really starting to run dry in many places, and most uh, desperately so in Yemen. Um, and very often, you can't really build a society. Uh, or at least if you have not succeeded in world history in building a society uh, that has not had good control over its water resources and uh, put it to productive use. Um, it's really a basis of a failing state, uh, which is what I think you're seeing in Yemen. Uh, Gidon, I want to bring you into the conversation. Uh, your organization, EcoPeace, Friends of the Earth Middle East, uh, really attempts to you know, advance these environmental and these sustainable issues beyond politics. You, know, you bring together Jordanians and Israelis and Palestinians. Is it possible to leave the politics behind and address these issues and get to some point of solution? Well, you can never leave the politics behind. But you can certainly focus on concrete issues of solving everyday water and sanitation issues. And that's what we focus on. So we bring communities that literally share the same water resources, communities along the Jordan River, Palestinian, Jordanian, Israeli. And we try to raise awareness of the different water realities along the same river, along the same river basin. And we work with school kids, we work with adults, we work with the mayors. We, we've literally you know, had events where we've brought Palestinian, Jordanian and Israeli mayors to jump into the Jordan River together, um, often with their bellies sort of uh, you know, out there. Um, but we, we do that in order to highlight that actually they've all been the losers, that it was national government in Jerusalem, in Amman, in Damascus that's actually turned off the tap and as the communities along the Jordan River, be they Israeli, Jordanian, or Palestinian, that have paid the price. So we're really focusing on self-interest, but in a, in a realm of, of trying to promote mutual benefit. 
Um, Anwar, you know, Gidon is, is talking about how some of the local government officials have found some unity here on this issue to, to try to change things. Give us a sense of what's going on with the Yemeni government. Um, are they doing all they can? They say it's a priority. Do you think they're making it one? No. Unfortunately, uh, water comes uh, in the top 10 priority areas in Yemen. Uh, in the previous government before the Arab Spring as um, number nine uh, of the top priority areas. Now, uh, the national dialogue up after the upheaval, uh, the new government is trying to raise it up to the top level uh, because the situation is extremely, extremely uh, difficult in Yemen. And uh, we are digging now up to uh, 1,000, more than 1,000 meters. We are using fossil water, and it's likely that the uh, water is going, we are going to run dry of water in the coming 20 or so years. Uh, the coverage, we are not in, in a position to reach, uh, to, to uh, uh, catch up with the uh, MDGs, and a uh, lot of people are, uh, you know, don't get uh, sufficient uh, water supply and good sanitation services mm -hmm. uh, at all. The so quality of water is also questionable. S Stephen, I, you know, on Anwar just mentioned it. He said it was like number nine on the list of 10. Why is this so low on government right. priority lists? Well, first of all, it, it, there was, I believe, an effort made uh, uh, just a couple of years ago uh, in a prior government uh, to try to do some water reforms. Uh, it didn't go terribly well because it interrupted some of the, um, what was alluded to before is the, uh, the power, uh, that is water represents power. Water mm -hmm. is a source of power. Mm -hmm. And if you try to take that water away from the people who have power, they fight your back. And it's embedded in many of the societies uh, across the world, including in the Middle East, uh, in the political arrangements uh, that are also, have been holding those uh, fragile states sometimes together. Uh, so they tried, for example, that there was a subsidy on uh, drilling of, of, uh, of drilling of wells, uh, which leads to a sort of a competition to the bottom. Yeah. And they tried to uh, take that away, and uh, that led to further uh, co uh, conflagrations uh, between different uh, uh, interest groups. Well, Sandy, staying in, in Yemen, uh, because you told us that you're going there tomorrow, there's a tweet here from Huzaifa who says, I'm in Yemen, and people here are more interested in using fresh water to grow cot than to use it for drinking purposes. There's also a video comment here on, on what Yemenis could possibly do. I want you to have a listen and let us know what you think. I live in Sana'a, Yemen, where we are the capital that is reputed to be running out of water by 2015, but yet the irony is that the massive rainwater that falls a couple of times a year is not harvested for reuse. Neither are there any recycling uh, water conservation measures, whether by the government or by the private sector, which seeks to recycle or reuse uh, grey water, for example. It is ironic then that when I go back to Hadramaut in the east of Yemen, water is in abundance over there. So, Sandy, how do you go about educating people about reusing things like rainwater? That's a good question. You know, I have heard so far, I've heard anecdotes from the field about, in some cases, there doesn't seem to be a cultural barrier in parts of Yemen about reusing. And then other folks I know who are building, uh, working on infrastructure projects to reuse gray water are saying that people actually don't want to reuse this water, that they think that this is unsafe, that this is unhealthy, and so forth. And so um, they find that there is often objection at the, at the higher end of the social uh, structures among the, the tribal leadership and so forth for using this kind of, of water. And I don't actually I haven't quite been able to get to the bottom of this yet to understand why there might be political opposition to this. Maybe there's a, another guest who would be able to speak on that, but it seems to be that there is, in some cases, real objection among community leaders to, to use that. And for the people who don't have good information on the safety issues and the benefits of reusing uh, gray water, well, then they're really just suffering from bad, uh, from, from lack of data. Um, and that's very unfortunate because I think that, that data sharing is a major problem in all of these cases that needs to be addressed. And uh, data sharing on why gray water reuse is, is good 
or is important, uh, that, that really, that, that is an issue that needs to be addressed. But Gidon, maybe somebody can say something about the political dimension. Gidon, maybe you can address the political dimensions and then the conservation technologies that, that you're trying to implement that are working uh, across various political lines. Well, certainly at the moment, uh, Israel, Jordan in particular, are world leaders in uh, the reuse of treated wastewater. It's actually not even gray water, it's black water that's uh, treated and reused. Israel is in fact the world leader. 80% uh, of the uh, sewerage is captured and then reused for agriculture. Jordan is not far behind. Um, Palestine very much wants to be there and uh, is trying to invest in sewage treatment plants despite all of the political difficulties of building them. Um, so that you know, wastewater is recognized more and more as an important uh, uh, resource in a water scarce region. Um, you know, our experience today with, with desalination, you know, combining uh, wastewater treatment plants, conservation, education, and the ability to desalinate, particularly using reverse osmosis, is that you know, uh, the idea of a water war you know, really doesn't make, ma make sense between countries. And there's certainly a lot of uh, animosity and conflict uh, between communities. But to go to war over water today when you, know, you can desalinate for 57 cents uh, seawater, well, you know, it's, it's, it's much cheaper to desalinate than to buy a fighter jet. And that, and that overall is good news. And there's a lot of evidence, you know, Oregon uh, State University has done um, some very good studies over the years that show that, in fact, there's very, very few uh, wars between countries over the last hundred years. Um, on the contrary, uh, we find that water, because of its, you know, the, its very nature is the essence of life, um, requires cooperation. Even you know, in the midst of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict where there's continued um, uh, occupation, um, where Palestinians are denied their fair share of water, we find that we can educate communities in Israel um, educate communities in Palestine and Jordan of the need to be working together in order to more fairly share water resources that, is, that are no longer a win-lose scenario, but a win-win scenario. Mm -hmm. um, where Gidon, you mentioned a lot of interesting points in that, and one of them that I want to pick up on because our community is weighing in on is desalination. Uh, Stephen, you know, he mentioned that it's cheaper to buy a fighter jet than it is uh, to undergo the process of desalination. No, 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 he said it was cheaper to desalinate, desalinate to buy a, rather buy, than buy a, a fighter jet. Sure. I want your thoughts on that because there's a tweet here, a Facebook sure. comment rather from Dominic. He says, sure. desalination will be the way forward to tap into the vast ocean's water resource. Very expensive. And another from Jay Candler who says, large-scale desalination is still very expensive expensive, energy intensive technology. Look at the Gulf region, look at Qatar, which is one of the countries that gets the vast majority of its water from desalination. Uh, you know, the Gulf both, relies on it. Well, all, all those, both those comments are true. Um, the, there's been a great uh, advances in, um, in desal uh, technology and, and, and in the long run, it's gonna be really one of the great uh, ways that we are going to be able eventually to solve the problem. The problem is on a global scale, the build out is going to take an awfully long time. However, in a place like um, Israel, which uh, Gidon is right, is, is uh, leading the, uh, uh, the charge in many, in many ways on this uh, water uh, issue uh, out of necessity, uh, they are building a bunch of uh, desal plants off the coast that is now going to be able, I think in a few years, to be able to produce as much water as Israel is currently taking from the West Bank aquifer, which is the aquifer that falls mainly on the Palestinian territories. So it absolutely is true that it would be worthwhile to, for, the, for, the, for the world <laughs> to, to, to finance some desal plants uh, and, and including the cost of shipping that water up, uphill, uh, which is very expensive, uh, rather than have a, uh, have a conflagration or a war, right, obviously. Right. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that not everybody is based close to the uh, coasts. Uh, the shipping costs are still high enough that we only see it being used it currently um, for its most important, uh, for, as a substitute for other water that is for only for its most valued use, which is for drinking. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not worthwhile for irrigation. Mm -hmm. It's not really worthwhile for energy production, um, some of the other uses of it. Right. Anwar, we're speaking about solutions. We've got about a minute and a half left in the program, but I, I, I want to let folks know that you've been helping the government there really to create a national water strategy plan. Talk about some of the solutions you've come up with and then your confidence level with the government as to when any of those are going to be implemented. 
Well, um, um, you have taken so much time talking to our guests and giving me very little time. I'm very sorry, but uh, it's unfair. Uh, desalination is not a solution for Yemen because uh, the majority of the population live uh, in uh, upper land and the cost of transmission of uh, a cubic meter is uh, about seven dollars five dollars to seven dollars and that's beyond the capacity of people to affordability to pay for water uh, for domestic purposes the solution in my mind is to uh, improve irrigation efficiency uh, which is uh, less than 40 percent and to provide more water for drinking uh, purposes uh, desalination for a poor country like Yemen is not a solution uh, the infrastructure is very expensive and uh, even uh, recycling is not foreseeable uh, gray water is uh, still in their uh, initial stages and if there's any gray water it's going to be producing very little amount of uh, water for drinking purposes so it's um, it's an academic thinking it's possible but it's, it's not uh, solving the problem like in a country like uh, Yemen and desalination okay. uh, well listen you know we're out of time for, in the main for, program for but Anwar, I want to be able to pick up with you when when we continue this discussion in our online post show because I know you've been working very hard uh, for solutions in Yemen so we want to hear about what some of those are that you've got on the table uh, so please everyone join us at streamed at aljazeera.com as we continue this conversation but first Malika just has a few other stories that we're following We begin today with an update to a show we did not too long ago on Catalonia's separatist movement. Earlier today, the stream received this tweet alleging the Spanish government applied pressure on a visiting professor at Georgetown University after her appearance on our show. Clara Ponsati, a research professor at the Institute of Economic Analysis in Barcelona, joined the stream in September to discuss mass demonstrations in Spain calling for an autonomous Catalan state. We reached out to Clara today, who told us she believes her position as visiting professor was not renewed due to her vocal stance on Catalonia. Take a listen. My colleagues at Georgetown heard, uh, you know, from the ambassador of Spain in Washington that uh, he, he was uh, uh, upset about my appearance in the Al Jazeera uh, program that you did after uh, the demonstration in uh, September 11th. Uh, and about, uh, you know, another appearance that they had done in the media and, you know, that they were, uh, um, they didn't feel that I was fit for that uh, chair because of that reason. Uh, so, you know, my colleagues insisted that, you know, that they still wanted to reappoint me because, you know, my opinions were irrelevant to my performance in the job. She went on to say the official reason she was given was that the ministry wanted to open up the opportunity to other professors. We reached out to the Spanish Ministry of Education's office here in Washington, but as of airtime, have not received a response, though we'll continue to follow this story. Our next lead comes from Egypt, where the widely read English language newspaper Egypt Independent is shutting down, much to the dismay of many online. Following a reported last-minute order from management to stop the printing of its 50th and final edition, the editorial team tweeted that it would release the issue online. The disappointment online was palpable. Bassam tweets, Losing Egypt independent is a horrible thing for Egypt, the region, and for everyone looking for professional and principled journalism. Well, from unemployment to environmental journalism, the banned issue delves into the challenges facing Egypt. And government critiques were no exception. We're always on the lookout for your stories, so don't forget to share them with us. Use the hashtag AJStream. Lisa? All right, stay with us because the post show is next. It's streamed at aljazeera.com. Now, on our next program, targeted killings, drone strikes, and secret commandos, they all play a central role in journalist Jeremy Scahill's latest book, Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield. On Monday, he'll join us in the studio to take us inside the United States' new covert wars and explain why he believes Americans are now at greater risk. So send us your thoughts and your questions for Jeremy. And until then, we'll see you online.
Welcome to the Streams Online Post Show. Today we're continuing our discussion on water scarcity and conflicts in the Middle East. I want to pick up where we left off with Anwar Sahuli. He's the team leader of the Yemen Water Sector Program. When we left the television portion of the show, Anwar, we were just getting into some of the solutions that you and your team have suggested to the Yemeni government. Can you, can you highlight a few of those for us? Sorry? Uh, can you highlight a few of the solutions that you and your team have suggested to the Yemeni government as a possible way out of this pending crisis? The first thing is that we have suggested to the Yemeni government is to look into uh, improving um, irrigation efficiency to s fight uh, the booming increase in the growing of cut which consumes um, 60% of the water resources in Yemen. Uh, the third thing is uh, that we have uh, have to lift uh, the uh, priority of water uh, to the highest level in the uh, most important issues uh, in uh, Yemen. Uh, we also uh, have to uh, work very hard to achieve the Millennium De uh, Development Goals. Uh, we have a high, very, very high uh, population growth that we can hardly cope up with. And, uh, you know, the most important thing, the, the, the solutions that your uh, guests were talking about were uh, for Yemen are highly academic, they are not practical. Like, uh, right, you had mentioned that, like the desalinization. Uh, you know, Stephen, you look at this really uh, uh, frequently from a macro perspective. When you look at Yemen and you see how balkanized it has become and how it continues to go in that direction, do you have concern that these water scarcity issues are going to make it less likely that they can even stay unified? Yeah, I mean, it already was a difficult state to begin with uh, before the water problems became worse. Um, you have you have a rebellion in the in, in the south. You have a, a little quasi civil war in the north. In the ungoverned regions, you have Al Qaeda in the Persian Gulf uh, operating, helping to dig well sometimes, I believe, uh, with the peasants to win hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's. What, what countries are doing and what Yemen is doing is digging deeper and, and as was mentioned by your guest into the into the aquifer uh, deeper these are not solutions um, and frankly uh, there are no clear paths uh, for a country like Yemen uh, that I can see um, we see more and more that we're having violence over water within states and we're seeing water contributing uh, to economic declines uh, and failing states mm -hmm which then breeds a whole set of uh, re regional problems and global uh, problems. Sandy, I want to bring in an issue here that we have, have yet to bring up, and I know you've got some thoughts on, and that is the role of women uh, when it comes to these water scarcity issues. Do they often bear a disproportionate burden? You know, women, um, the challenge that women face often, and this can vary, it's important we, uh, that, that we look at the dynamics around women and the challenges that women face when it comes to poor water supply. However, we have a common image of, well, if women uh, don't have access to safe water, then they have to spend a lot of time getting to the well, getting to whatever the water source is, and that's uh, time that's wasted that could be used for education or for uh, uh, income of another kind. And the challenge is, it's really not that simple. We have to look at the costs that women bear when it comes to managing the household, caring for the sick, um, and uh, when it comes to household food production and things like that. We have to look at all of those, sort of that broader web of what water is used for and what the consequences are of poor water supply. Um, what are the consequences for women? And then it's not just that all women bear the same cost, it depends on your socioeconomic status. Um, so poor women are going to be far more vulnerable, their households are far more vulnerable and, uh, you know, than wealthier households. So uh, th these are all different uh, sort of things that we need to think about. We can't just categorize the problems that women face as an issue of carrying water, uh, you know, in a jerry can or on their heads in a bucket from a well or a stream. It's simply not that basic as, as we like to characterize it. 
Well, Stephen, uh, shifting gears here, we have a Facebook comment from Talal. He says, a lot of people think about water in terms of what they drink mm -hmm. and don't realize the actual financial value and cost of access to fresh water in many industries from clothes to soft drinks. Can you talk about that? And also, you know, recently um, something that's been passed around online is, is this video from National Geographic yeah. um, basically saying that it takes 2,700 liters of water plus a lot of energy to get us the T-shirts that we wear, just for a T-shirt. Right. So it's, it's kind of this lack of understanding that it takes that much water right. to right. you know for us to wear the clothes that we right, do right uh, we, we uh, in the in the West if you have a meat-eating diet you probably consume in the form of food um, about uh, about four tons of water uh, every day each day that went into making the food uh, that the growing the food that you're eating we call that virtual water um, the same is true you can add and there's another couple of uh, tons for the clothes that we're wearing to produce the tons industries would grind to a halt without using just in, in vast amounts of water. Um, the semiconductor chip uh, that we use in the, in the computer uh, uses as much water as a city of 50,000 people to produce. Wow. Um, so so you, 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 what you find is that, um, that the amount for domestic purposes for drinking water is really quite fractional, uh, is tiny, and really and truly in the world, if, you, if we did a, allocated that as a top priority, uh, we would be able to have enough for, for basic drinking water, for, for sanitation, that sort of thing, uh, even in Yemen, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, that requires unraveling um, a whole set of, of, um, of, of political structures and economic structures uh, that you know, will, people will fight over. It's incredible. We have a tweet here from Andy Bellotti. I'll pull it up right along the lines of what you're saying. He says, whoops, I just deleted it. There it is. He says, certainly troubling when many big beverage companies exacerbate water shortage issues in developing nations. We were talking earlier about India. That's right. Uh, India already has had a major conflict uh, in part of one part of the country between you knowing Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, both actually, uh, for their bottling plants were, were uh, uh, drilling wells and the villagers believed it's not quite clear whether it was actually the case or not in actuality, but we're causing, uh, in a region that has a lot of water problems, uh, we're being accused of being the source of those water problems. I think those water problems were probably um, already there and maybe, maybe have been exacerbated uh, by the Coca-Cola. So yes, they, so big business is waking up to this problem, uh, that they have a, a global supply ch uh, 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 chain. And anywhere along the lines, it can get interrupted if there, for whatever reason, uh, is a not available water. It could be a political disruption. It could be a climate change disruption. Mm -hmm. It could be many things. Well, Gidon, you know, we ended the live portion of the TV show uh, talking about solutions. Sophia here on Twitter has uh, another suggestion. She says, I think the media has a major role to, to start creating smart fillers to inform people how to save water. And she goes on to say, media must talk about the access to clean and fresh water in terms of rights people don't know uh, are, are the law. So in terms of, you know, the work that you and your organization do, is a lot of that about informing people just about their rights? <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, um, my comment earlier that you know, desalination is an important aspect of the solution is that desalination is part of the picture. But first and foremost, we need to uh, control the way we use water. We need to manage our water resources. We need good governance. We need the government uh, to be involved in pricing water at a, uh, at a sustainable price that pays for the full costs um, uh, of, of its supply, of its use to the public. Um, we need to be educating. We, you know, we need water education really fr from um, the uh, kindergarten level throughout school. There should be advertisements, public uh, ads uh, informing people, and um, policies to, to put in um, at, at the domestic level in our homes, water saving devices and, and uh, uh, considerable measures, as was said earlier, in agriculture, which really takes the lion's share of, of water in most parts of the world. We need to be asking ourselves, does it make sense to be growing, like we grow in this part of the world, bananas in the middle of the desert? And of course, it doesn't make sense. So there's, there's a tremendous amount uh, to be done through education, through policy. Um, but in the end, in, in dry, uh, you know, semi desert parts of the world where population continues to grow, uh, desalination will play a role and it can play an important role to uh, uh, avoid conflict. 
Um, here in Israel, Palestine, at Friends of the Middle East, we're actually promoting that uh, water can be the way to move forward in the peace process. And uh, 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 for President Obama's recent visit, we put out a proposal calling on the U.S. administration to move first on water, because water can, by solving the Israeli-Palestinian uh, water issues by seeking an agreement on water for the fair share of water resources, which means making more water available to Palestinians from shared uh, Israeli-Palestinian sources and, and uh, replacing that water through greater conservation and some desalination. We have a real win-win on the table that can help us move forward on the other issues. So water can have a really important aspect not just in conflict, but in peace building. And, 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 that's, and, that, and that, that's often not highlighted enough. Uh, well, not only is it not highlighted enough, it, it's an outstanding way for us to end the program uh, on, on a bit of an up note. So thank you to all of our guests for sharing your thoughts with us on today's program. On our next show, targeted killings, drone strikes, uh, secret commandos, they all play a central role in journalist Jeremy Scahill's latest book, Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield. On Monday, he's going to join us in the studio and take us inside the United States' new covert wars and explain why he believes Americans are now at greater risk. Until then, we'll see you online.